Hey everyone, and welcome to What Did I Miss? Where today I'll be covering the new Star Trek No. 1 comic from IDW Publishing, which features the return of Captain Benjamin Sisko. Now I'm sure you have a lot of questions, such as when this story takes place, and is it canon to the Star Trek main storyline that is currently being produced by Paramount? Well, I'm here to answer all those questions as well as run through the comic itself while also giving you my opinion as to how I think this story will be connected to the characters that we see every week on screen. The issue begins with Benjamin Sisko appearing in a void while the Prophets guide his corporeal form back into existence. The Prophets state that the Sisko must descend into the places of nothing and everything into the cities of gods and heretics. The Sisko must go where no one has gone before. Where No One Has Gone Before is also the title of an episode of The Next Generation that was the first one to feature the entity known as the Traveler who would eventually recruit Wesley Crusher. This could be a hint that we will see Sisko interact with Wesley as a Traveler before the end of the series. While Sisko is being brought back, his first audible word is Jake, the name of his son. Next we see a story written by Jake Sisko titled What We Left Behind, which of course is a reference to the series finale of Deep Space Nine, which was titled What You Leave Behind. Jake's story starts when Zephyr and Cochran launched a homemade starship from the ruins of a missile silo and achieved faster than light travel for the first time in human history, and details Earth's first contact with the Vulcans and then later establishing the United Federation of Planets. Jake also points out how the intention was to design a utopia, but that was not always what he has experienced. He then goes into his own personal story of his mother dying at the Battle of Wolf 359 and then him and his father going to live on Deep Space Nine. This prologue more or less acts as a summarization of the events of Deep Space Nine including the Dominion War and his father being taken away by the Prophets, catching the reader up to the current place and time. We then see that Jake is still looking out the same window at the Bajoran wormhole waiting for his father to return and that he is speaking with Kira Norris. Jake tells Norris that his article did not get published and that this was the 78th rejection that he has received all since his father has left. It is also in this conversation that we learn when this story takes place. Jake says, The Dominion War has been over for three years, Kira and everyone's already forgotten about it and moved on. Like we didn't all leave so much of the galaxy broken, I promised I was going to tell their stories, his story, referring to his father. Just as Norris is trying to encourage Jake to move on with his life, his father appears on the main floor of the promenade. Benjamin Sisko is still very disoriented when he first arrives, and as time passes, he no longer hears the voices of the prophets in his head. Just as he says, I'm all alone again, him and his son embrace, while Norris looks out at the wormhole and says thank you to the prophets. The next panel shows Sisko being looked over by doctors, interviewed by Starfleet, visiting with Bajoran Vedics, and even stopping by Quarks, basically trying to reassimilate into his surroundings while the people around him try to decide what to make of his return. Sisko is also forgetting more and more of his time with the Prophets the longer that he is on the station, but he does remember the word Hephaestus. Jake arrives to speak with his father in his quarters, and he has news that Cassidy Yates is flying back to Deep Space Nine to see them and that she's bringing their daughter Sarah. Sarah also being the name of Benjamin Sisko's mother, who was possessed by a prophet before Ben was born. This could be a hint that Ben's daughter may also have a connection to the prophets, and even though she is only three when the story begins, that does not mean much since the prophets live outside of normal space-time. Benjamin feels like he cannot wait for Cassidy and Sarah, and that he must embark on the mission that the prophets set him off to do. The first person that Benjamin Sisko seeks out to help him is Captain Jean-Luc Picard, our first of many surprise cameo appearances in the story. Sisko tells Captain Picard, the Prophets, the wormhole aliens, they've seen something coming, something even they can't stop. My mind it wasn't, it isn't capable of holding what they saw, just fragments, but I know the galaxy depends on this mission, they need a captain, they sent me. Picard then reminds Sisko that he is not an admiral and that he can't just requisition a ship for him. Picard asks Sisko why he doesn't just ask for a ship himself, since Sisko is still a respected war hero for his actions in the Dominion War. In response to this, Sisko tells Picard why he came to him specifically. He says, And then I was taken over by a mysterious alien race, no one else understands, and had my body and mind forever changed. That's why you, of all people. I really love this scene with these two characters, because not only is it a callback to the first time these two characters met in the pilot episode of Deep Space Nine, but it also showed how now, Sisko can better understand the trauma that Picard faced after he was assimilated by the Borg. Picard tells Sisko about a quartermaster that he knows in Starfleet research that has a ship, and that he will allow Sisko to use it if Picard is allowed to pick his first officer. It is at this point that Commander Data walks into the room holding a cat carrier with Spot in tow. This story takes place about one year before the events of Star Trek Nemesis, which is why Picard is still a captain and Data is still alive. Data and Sisko then share a shuttle to their new ship and talk while Data plays solitaire. The ship that they arrive at is known as the USS Theseus, 
and is an NX Discovery class experimental vessel. The name of the vessel may be a reference to the Ship of Theseus thought experiment. You are familiar with the thought experiment, the Ship of Theseus in the field of identity metaphysics. Naturally. Which asks if a ship that has had its parts stripped away and rebuilt is still the same ship. This could be a way to describe Benjamin Sisko's current journey, since he was literally torn away from his physical form by the prophets and then recreated at the beginning of this story. The specs on the vessel state that it was first commissioned over a hundred years before Sisko was given command of it, as well as several other encounters the ship endured, such as a first contact mission with an alien race known as the Zen Kethi that resulted in the deaths of almost everyone on board the ship. The Zen Kethi were never seen on screen, but were mentioned in the DS9 episode The Adversary. However, they are a major antagonist in the Star Trek Online game and are shown to have ties to the Changelings. It also states that the ship was involved in the V'ger Crisis, which was the villain of the first Star Trek motion picture, but the big reveal is that for the past seven years it has been under the command of Captain Montgomery Scott. In the Next Generation episode Relics, Scotty was found to have been kept alive as a transporter pattern after the ship that he was on was damaged and he was saved by the crew of the Enterprise-D. It looks like Scotty decided to forego retirement and enlist back in Starfleet and it makes perfect sense that they would give Scotty a ship that was first commissioned in the time that he was originally from. A schematic of the ship is also shown and I noticed a part of the ship labeled as classified, which I'm sure will come up again later on. Sisko and Data then meet up with Scotty and discuss the ship they are on while Scotty states that he has made the ship a work of art as he transfers command of the ship to Sisko. Captain Sisko then meets the rest of the crew, the first being an Andorian named Ensign Sato. This character is a descendant of Hoshi Sato, the communications officer of the NX Enterprise under Captain Jonathan Archer. Seated next to Ensign Sato is Lieutenant Tom Paris, who also served on the USS Voyager under Captain Janeway. Since this story takes place three years after the Dominion War has ended, that would mean that the Voyager would have returned from the Delta Quadrant more than a year before. Another returning character, this time from the Next Generation cast, is Dr. Beverly Crusher, whose purpose on this ship is not only to be the Chief Medical Officer, but also to monitor Cisco for Starfleet. Given Ensign Sato's heritage, it means that there is a character from every one of the first six series of Star Trek serving on this ship. The only other crew member we meet is a Vulcan ensign named Talir. After the introductions are made, Dr. Crusher clears Captain Sisko for duty and the captain tells the bridge crew the nature of their mission. He says, Out there is a single point in space, coordinates, our destination, the Hephaestus Nebula, catalogued once from a Ferengi freighter and deemed worthless by all accounts and limited record. It is empty space, and yet the prophets have told me that is exactly where we need to be. While the ship is en route to their destination, Benjamin spends some time with his son and getting to know the rest of the crew. Scotty even tells Sisko about a time where he and the crew of the original Enterprise faced off with a god, in that case Apollo, retelling the events of the original series episode Who Mourns for Adonis. At first when they arrive at the coordinates in space, they do not see anything, but after scanning the area they realize they are surrounded by multiple life forms. As Captain Sisko calls for red alert, hundreds of life forms known as the Crystalline Entity emerge. This creature first appeared in the Next Generation episode titled Data Lore. Their sudden appearance frightens most of the crew, including Data, who can still conveniently turn off his emotion chip. However, Tom Paris still finds time to take a selfie to send back to his wife Belana Torres and their daughter Meryl. Suddenly, Sisko is communicating once again with the Prophets, who tell him that he is too late and that they are dying. A large ship emerges in front of them, and the crystalline entities begin sending out a high-pitched frequency, which Ensign Sato translates to them being scared. Suddenly, the mysterious ship fires a weapon that instantly obliterates all the crystalline entities in the area and vanishes. Sisko says, These things are like the tides, isn't that right, Dr. Crusher? Same as Scotty's Apollo, or the Prophets, or the damn Q. We can call them whatever we'd like, but I think the Bajorans may have had it right. Call them for what they are, gods, and we just watch them die, as the comic book ends. I thought that this was a great way to kick off the story, which has been billed as the Star Trek version of Marvel's The Avengers with main characters from each series appearing, as well as some of their supporting ones. It will also be interesting to see if these events are mentioned during the third season of Star Trek Picard, since that will be the next time that we see Picard and Dr. Crusher together on screen. Which brings me to the most important question that everyone has about this story, is it canon? IDW, the company that is publishing the story, has been publishing new Star Trek material for almost 15 years, and I can remember reading their tie-in comics to the Star Trek 2009 reboot film, which were really good. At the time, the company stated that their stories were canon until they weren't, which basically meant that these stories are written with the idea that they are going to be part of the same universe that we see on screen. But if a movie producer or series writer came along later and wanted to contradict something told in these stories, then they could do that. For the most part, I believe that the stories told in the IDW comic book line have remained canon and the company has continued to create content for new series such as Discovery and Picard. 
If this is true, you may be asking yourself, why then would Star Trek choose to have Benjamin Sisko return in the pages of a comic book and not on screen where everyone expects to see him? I think if anything, the writers of the comic book using the character Sisko in this manner is a referendum on the fact that no one at Paramount believes Avery Brooks will ever return to play the character. If there were even a chance that they could bring him back on screen, then there is no way they would bring Sisko back in this manner. Especially if he were to return on screen at any point in the future, then everyone would be wondering what happened to bring him back. So instead of just wasting the character or doing something worse like recasting him, Paramount is choosing to use his character the only way they can, which in this case is in the pages of a comic book. While that part of it is disappointing, I'm glad to see the character return and look forward to seeing where the story goes. Well that was everything I have, but let me know in the comments if I missed anything. Thanks very much for watching, and don't forget to smash the like and subscribe buttons to help my channel grow, and I will see you next time on What Did I Miss?